Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. This is on the deck, jumped in and, and got him, went to grab the life jacket to swim to the boat and it starts to come off over his head. And oh my fortunately, God. I've had a lot of life-saving uh, you know, training when I went to the Coast Guard Academy. So mm -hmm. I knew how to get him to the boat, but you know, grandpa was freaking out. He, I said, throw me the throwable because I always, I don't know, Chris, if you do this, but I, I show him the throwable. In fact, and when I have three people on the boat or me and two others, the guy in the middle seat sits on the sits throwable. On it. It's out. It's out. It's out all the time. Yeah. And I tell him if somebody goes and I tell him right away, I said, look, if somebody goes overboard, I will go get you. Then you have no matter what the parent has to stay in the boat, and their one job is to throw me that throwable mm -hmm. and help help us get to the boat. We're going to work to the boat, then we're going to work to the back of the boat, and then come in because it's a lot easier to get up through the back of the boat than it is on the the front or or, or the sides. And that's mm -hmm. just part of the, everything that I do when I introduce somebody to the boat. But one time I going through my stuff, I, I'd say like, uh, you know, if there's a fire, you know, you want to grab the uh, the fire extinguisher, you want to pull the trigger, uh, pull the pin, squeeze the trigger, aim at the base of the fire. And the fire gets out of control. The exits are here, 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 here. <laughs> so, John, John Sisson, Captain John Sisson was, we were doing a two boat trip and he is a retired firefighter. So he hears me doing my little firefighting thing. And then he says to his pastor, he says, do you, do you hear what he said? He, they go, yeah. And they go, don't listen to him. You see a fire, you jump in the water right away. <laughs> don't wait for it to get out of control. I think a lot of people actually need to hear that about with this colder weather, it's deceptive. Like it's 80 degrees two days ago, but it's one step off of a bass boat and your whole day. Like, do you guys carry extra clothes or would you suggest carrying extra clothes if you're going to be out there? Yeah, Chris, I, 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 I don't, uh, I carry basically what, what I, what I need. Uh, if somebody were to go overboard, that would be a tough situation because they, we just don't have a lot of room on the boat. Yeah. I've had people who bring extra clothes. Uh, they, you know, they bring extra shoes and everything else and we try to find a spot for it, but that's just one of the luxuries that we don't have running a bass boat where we have to carry not only our life jacket, life jackets for them, and we have to carry tackle for three people. So mm -hmm. everything that we have, I mean, our boxes are, are full. I try to leave one box open uh, for the, anything they wanted to bring for eating and drinking. I try to tell them how to prepare for the weather, uh, that kind of thing. But as far as that extra, if they fall in, uh, that would just be uh, like Chris has said, if you're out there and it happens, you, you share what you got on and try to move at a safe speed and get back to some place where they where they won't get uh, uh, hypothermia. But you know, like you say, even though it's 80 degrees, you know, the water's like 50, 55. That's cold. Yeah. That's cold. Right. I mean, you know, your, your bathtub is 90. You know? So mm. <laughs> you get uh, you get in that cold water and it makes it hard to breathe. And, and uh, even though the Potomac's shallow, they've got grass. So I remember at Pohick, uh, I guess the police, Fairfax County police were doing a, um, a training session and they lost a police officer, I guess about eight, nine years ago, who wow. went into the grass, got, got confused in the grass, didn't know which end was up and ended up uh, drowning there. And uh, so there's, even mm -hmm. though the water's shallow, I mean, I always wear, I wear an auto inflatable. Um, I, it, I had provided those for my passengers, but I got to a point where I wasn't sure if they would actually work or I was hundred percent. So I just went Good back point. to the best. Yeah. You know, I, I, I hope they work because I wear them. Like I said, to this day, I wear a, a HIT, the hydrostatic inflation uh, that mm -hmm. just when they get underwater, they inflate uh, those you can store in your boat. If you like the other kind that have the little, I call it an Alka-Seltzer. Uh, when it hits the water, it dissolves. Sometimes it'll dissolve in your rod lockers or it'll yep. dissolve in raining and that, that doesn't help you. Um, I don't know. What do you do, Chris? I, I know you carry PFDs. You know, um, that's a, man, that's a real good, good, good topic right there. So <clears throat> a friend of mine, um, I think, you know, pretty well, um, uh, Scott Favors, he's the president of Battlefield, <clears throat> Bass Angle of Virginia. And, he told me, I remember when he called me, he uh, had a hydraulic steering went out on his boat and he was at on plane 
And, uh, oh my God. you know, of course, you know, it, it threw him hard left, you know, and I mean, he didn't see it coming, threw him off the boat. I mean, he had the, you know, the, uh, all the inflatable on and believe it or not, it, it didn't go off. His did not go off. And luckily, you know, he was conscious whenever he was thrown off. Um, but there are some folks that are not as fortunate. And if it doesn't go off, you know, you'll, you'll drown. So I'm like Captain Steve on that one. Um, I've kind of gotten to just wearing the, the regular zip up vest because they, they won't fail. They should, if they're worn properly, they should not fail. Um, as far as the clothes go, yeah, I'm definitely in agreement. So I think one of the biggest thing is you can always take off, but you can't put on, you know, and you know, like I said, when it's 80 degrees, but that water is 50, I mean, hypothermia can still, you know, set up. So, I mean, a lot, a lot of times I tell people to bring a, like an extra jacket, um, you know, just, just, just to be safe, you know, you can always sit on your jacket or whatever, but you know, you can't bring it if you don't have it, you know, so try to be prepared, but you know, don't go like you're on a seven day cruise to, uh, to Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> what this time of year is so interesting because I remember last year early, we had all the BFLs here. We had two or three kayak tournaments in April, and this is notorious for small craft advisory. I mean, last week it was like, what, 400 mile an hour winds. Uh, it was insane. <laughs> it was up there. And there's, I love comment sections because it's a fantastic place to find good content. And one of it was like, well, there's no small craft advisory today. And cause it was like just below the threshold for that. So I'm going to go take the boat out, but it's like, should the small craft advisory be your barometric for going out or it, what do you think it should be to be like, ah, it's just not worth it. Wow. I, I, I tell you what, that, that has been my enemy as of lately. Cause it's like, you want to go, you want to go, but at the end of the day, it's all about your client safety. It's all about your client safety. That's the one thing I don't want. I don't want to go out there knowing the fish bite. And I got to go to a small Creek or whatever, but I'm taking my client's life at risk and it's just not worth it. Me, I think one of the biggest things, I think when the Coast Guard and National Weather Services put those uh, advisors out, I think they really look at the course to wind speeds, but you're always also looking at tide direction. Is it going out? Is it incoming? What direction is the wind blowing? And there are times you can plan your plan your trip accordingly. Even looking at the timing of this small craft, I think Friday I went out. I believe it was Friday, so I knew I had west wind. So I was like, okay, so if I go on the Mad Woman side, I'm probably going to get beat up on the way back. But if I stay on the Virginia side, maybe run up in Aquaquan, Pohick, those areas like that, um, even the Absco, I'd probably be pretty, pretty fine. But you always, always got to look at that forecast. I mean, I stay, I look at the hourly forecast. Um, that way I, I know, you know, kind of what's going on. Um, and they, I mean, they teach you that, you know, even, even uh, going through your schooling with Coast Guard, you know, about frontal boundaries and what to look for. So, you know, like Cap Steve said, people really don't understand being a guide or being a licensed captain. Man, you got to look at everything. You have to look at everything. I mean, you're a time manager, you're, you're a meteorologist, you're, you're a mm -hmm. mechanic, you're a firefighter. I mean, you look at <laughs> everything. So it, it, it's, it's people say, man, you know, that's a lot of money to go fishing. You know, well, I mean, some of these guys got boat payments. And, I mean, they're, they're schooling, paying for knowledge. You know, I mean, it, there's a lot involved. But, yeah, I mean, that small craft advisor to me – I mean, once it gets around that 10, 10 mile an hour, maybe up to 12, 10 to 12, then I'm like, okay, I need to be start looking around. Once it, we're talking 15, hey, we're looking at probably rescheduling for sure. For sure. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm like Chris. I, I'm hourly on the weather. And I also, mm -hmm. if there's any chance of thunderstorms, I got, I guess they called it Sparky on, uh, on Weatherbug, <laughs> where they would tell you, they'd say, hey, <laughs> and they have a little lightning bolt. Uh, theirs was, I think if you're 10 miles out away from a uh, lightning and for me, it was 50, uh, I, if it's 50, <laughs> I'm looking. and like Chris, I also have a few spots because I know that most of the wind on the Potomac is out of the Northwest. So I've got some spots on the Virginia side that, that I can fish. Bell Haven is a great place to, to fish. Uh, and, and I have, you have to have me because 
a lot of times people, you know, we don't realize it until you're on the other side, but people have made plans for like three, four weeks to be fishing with you that day. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I've got to find every way possible that's safe to get them out on the water. And I'll tell people right up front, I go, look, it's 15, 20 mile an hour wind today. Uh, we can go out, but we're going to idle to our spot and we're going to fish and we're going to fish in a, a pretty small area because we're not going to be running up and down the river. We'll go out. If you want to shorten the trip, we can do that. But uh, if you want to go fishing, those are the rules. And if you want to cancel or postpone, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. But uh, yeah. uh, it, it's a safety thing. And, and uh, like Chris said, it's uh, we become weathermen, too. Amen. Yeah, yeah. And you I know, think this is uh, important. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, I was going to say, too, you know, the, one of the other options, too, that I've even offered, like, <clears throat> basically, like, Saturday, we had that big old blow on Saturday. I told my clients, I was like, tell me, because I, I mean, they're talking about gusts of 25, looking at that time. And, and one of the other options, especially early in the season, is Lake Anna. I mean, it's more confined. And we moved that trip from the Potomac to Lake Anna, and they they had a great trip, you know. I mean, I feel like I could have did a whole lot better, but, you know, being prepared, you know, at that time. Because that's the other, I guess, curse, being a guy, you know, Anna, being on Potomac, the lower Potomac. So trying to keep up with everything that's going on all the time, you know. So I'm constantly going out on my own trying to figure out and keep up on stuff too. But, yeah, definitely, you know, leaving those options too because a lot of folks, they're like, hey, we just want to fish. You know, so we'll take Lake Anna or we'll take, you know, mm, you know Potomac or even the Rappahannock Rivers. Yep. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's the only uh, – Chris is the only uh, captain – uh, on the river that is multi-species, number one, but also is an expert in several areas. So like for me, Tidal mm -hmm. Potomac, primarily the from Doe Creek North, uh, John Sisson, he'll do the whole river, put in and out everywhere. Uh, but, uh, you know, Chris is the only one that will go to different fisheries. And knowing both of those, those are pretty good. That There's no qualifications out at Lake Anna. So, yeah. Uh, you know, you take what you get out there, except uh, Chris is a licensed captain. He's probably, I think he's the only one out there that actually has a Coast Guard captain's license. Yeah, you know, I, I got to put a pin on this right here, Tom, still, but, you know, I remember when I was, I don't know, 19, 20 years old, 21 years old, and there was a uh, Prince William County police officer, a guy named Mike Cole. Great fisherman. I think he's fishing in a TBO club. I think it's Bass Snipers. Um, I think it's Bass Snipers of Virginia. I think it was. But, you know, he's one of the first guys that took me on a bass boat. I mean, I was fishing the pier at Smallwood State Park. And I remember reading um, Captain, Captain Steve's post, and he talked about fishing and things he's using. I remember reading about before I even met him. You know what I mean? I, I was just inspired by his post, inspired by his writing. Yeah, well, and, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, and then, then to meet him, you know, and see like the love of the sport, the love of tournament fishing. I mean, he really inspired me. I mean, there was a lot of guys that inspired me, but you know, Captain Steve was definitely, definitely one man. And I'm gonna tell you something, y'all. You, know, you know, if if you want to be inspired, if you want to learn, one thing about Captain Steve, he's a great teacher. I, there's a lot of guys. Yeah, they want a new spot, but there's a lot of clients that want to just learn. They want to be taught. They want somebody to, you know, hold their hand. I mean, through it, seriously. And I don't know how many clients I've had said, yeah, they've had bad experiences. Yeah, we call fish all day, but they didn't show me. They didn't do. People want a teacher. You know, they want a teacher. And that's the approach I try to try to get into but one thing i i will say is, is definitely captain steve man um he he really inspired me he really inspired me and, I, and captain steve i just want to say man thank you man hey you. how did you, you know, do I, meet he, he he's given uh, me a lot of credit and i and i appreciate that chris but when i met chris i saw a guy who wanted everybody to be included in bass fishing i mean he he really in fact we we met through tournament fishing and I've, I've told all, I mean, it's not hard with the guides that I work with because they all fish tournaments, but most people look at a guide and they go like, they think I'm competing with, a, with tournament anglers or that I'm opposed to tournament anglers. Uh, I've put, and Chris will know this, I've put my butt on the line uh, and gotten into some pretty heavy battles with 
the Maryland Department of Natural Resources to keep tournament fishing going. In fact, it was kind of interesting. They they have a black bass committee, and I um, was on that or on various committees with the with Maryland for probably 10, 12 years, along with a small group of uh, guys like Scott Sewell, Roger Tregasar, uh, Dick Barrick, uh, you know Steve uh, Weimer. So there were a group of us that were there from the beginning, and we ended up having a a conflict over tournament fishing. And I, you know, I threw every punch I had, and in doing so, I, I irritated and got under the skin of some uh, management people with the Department of Natural Resources in Maryland. And they they came up with a new rule, and they said, "Oh, uh, unless you're a Maryland resident, you can't be on this committee." So. <laughs> I, I got booted. Dick Barrett got booted. St uh, Steve Weimer got booted. So mm. they started with 13 with 13 people on this committee. Last Monday, they had a meeting. They had four, four show up, four out of the 13 on a Zoom meeting. Roger Tragasar pretty much mm. threw his hands in the air and he turned to the department and he said, hey, we have this rule. It's a ridiculous rule that we can't have guys that uh, don't live in, in Maryland. You know, both of <laughs> Me and, me and Weimer were at this last meeting because we have something to contribute. I, you know, I know a lot about what's going on on the Potomac. Weimer knows he's a Pennsylvania guy. Uh, Dick, Dick Barrick, who wasn't there, is a Delaware guy. So we all use Maryland waters and fish Maryland waters, and we are all supportive of tournaments. That's the one thing that, that we have in common because it's, it's not just tournaments. I'm not like a tournament-only guy. I want anybody to get out and fish. Um, when I'm at the when I'm at the boat dock, and Chris said I like to teach, and sometimes I get carried away with. It, but I'm at the boat dock. I pull my boat out of the water, and somebody says, "Oh, how'd you catch him today?" And I'll say, "Oh, I was drop shotting. Drop shotting. What's that?" And I go, "Well, here, let me show you how to tie it. If you have a rod? I'll tie one up for you. Here's a handful of baits. You know, get out there and do it." So my wife, I'd already called my wife, said so I was pulling the boat out. I don't show up, you know, in 10, 15 minutes. She knows somebody asked me something at the dock, and that's where I'm at it and talking to people. But uh, well, that's because you're a celebrity. I, I too. Like, yeah. And I like I like the anglers. I, you know, bass fishermen are, you know, for the most part are really good guys. And the ones who aren't, you know, and we you know, try to avoid talking about them. But most of the guys are, are like Chris. You know, you see Chris somewhere, he's always in a good mood and you know, we always have great conversations and everybody I've talked to that's fished with him has had a blast. It's not only did they catch fish, but, you know, he, I, I think he's stealing some of my jokes. I think that's what the problem is. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I got to watch him. But they say they're having a good time. And, and, and that's what it's about. It's, it's part entertainment, but heavy emphasis on education. And it, it, it's always uh, troubling when you get guys out there they come out with their own rods and reels and their own tackle and you know that gee, they're not going to listen to anything i i say they just want me to take them to the fish and you mm -hmm. know we do the best we can and eventually you know if they're smart uh you know i I've, I've been fishing with some of the best anglers in the world as as a media guy and and thomas you're you're starting to get into this thing <laughs> I, I got I got a chance to fish with everybody. I mean, you know, any, name any of the top older pros. I got a chance to be in a boat with them. And, and a lot of times I wouldn't fish. I would ask them questions. I'd watch what they did. I would take photos. So I've been I've been with a lot of these guys and I've learned a lot. And I like to share that. I mean, I just did a video on um, on jerkbait fishing. And there's there's a thing about jerkbaits. You guys have fished them. You know, the pause is a big deal. And the length mm -hmm. of the pause. Could be the only deal it could be a two second pause a 10 second 20 second and the example i used was george cochran who he, he won an flw championship he won a a classic and george was fishing in gunnersville and in alabama and there you needed a five or six pound average to win a tournament there during during the spawn and george was catching two and three pounders and so he didn't really have anything going into day one and Larry Nixon, who was a cousin of his, you know, Arkansas, they're all related. But he, they, uh, <laughs> wherever they are. But they, anyway, they, he said, oh, I'm catching him on a jerkbait. So Cochran goes out there, goes to his spot. He winds down his crankbait. He catches his limit of two pounders. And he knows that ain't going to do it. That's not going to win this tournament. So what does he do? He just decides to pull out a jerkbait. He throws a jerkbait. Jerk, jerk, pause, boom, he catches a fish, another two-pounder. Jerk, jerk, pause, another two-pounder. So he's not really upgrading at all. So he makes a cast. He goes, jerk, jerk. And all of a sudden, he sees a boat come by. And he's looking, and he's looking, and he goes, who is that? What is that? Where is he headed? I, 
maybe I know that guy. And then all of a sudden, wham, he gets a fish. And he realized at that point that he's going to have to wait for another boat to come by before he catches a fish or pause a long time. And I think he picked up on that pause. So I like to use examples like that when I'm when I'm teaching my clients or when I'm doing videos, telling people, hey, this isn't me. These are things that I've learned. And, you know, sometimes you don't invent the wheel. You know, you've got to go with somebody else that's invented it. And maybe you polish it up a little bit. You know, like the first time I saw drop shotting, you know, I, I you know, basically said, OK, that's a, a, a Western thing, clear water, deep, six pound test, teeny little hooks, mm -hmm. teeny little baits. And 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 then I saw Rick Clun on the Potomac drop shotting in Woman Creek with 20 pound test and a six inch worm and a three odd hook. And I went, maybe there are other ways to fish this thing. Mm -hmm. So I tried to share stories like that and and like chris said i look forward to the people that come out to want to learn something and i until they tell me i don't want to learn anything i'm teaching the whole time the whole time and uh i just had a little a little kid come out i have a pond at my place out in west virginia and we're having some work done the guy brought his granddaughter she was like 12 years old and she loves to fish so I walked her down to the pond and she, I said, I'll, I'll been teach you how to cast. She says, well, I've never thrown a, a spinning reel before. I said, this is mm -hmm. what I do. I will teach you. And in about 10, 15 minutes, I had her casting a spinning rod. I That's said, awesome. you know, there, there's good news now. The good news is that you know how to cast a spinning rod. The bad news is now grandpa has to go out and buy you a spinning rod and reel because that's what you're going to be fishing with from now on. <laughs> Chris, how hard is it? to balance a life as a guide, but then also as a tournament angler. Um, Cause it's almost a tale of two different things, especially on <clears throat> the Potomac river. That is such a spot oriented place compared to like a Smith mountain lakes type of deal. That's gotta be stressful. Um, you know, I, I kind of don't let it bother me too much. Cause people will ask, well, you gotta watch. Cause I remember, you know, um, I, I know uh, Captain Steve remember um, Teddy Carr, you know, when Teddy Carr was out there fishing he was fishing, um, the, uh, back then it was the ABA weekend series and, and I asked him the same question. I was like, man, did, you know, does it kind of bother you that, you know, you're going maybe fish the same spot that you got known or vice versa. But the one thing I've learned is it, sometimes you don't have to go to your juice. You know what I mean? But you can, <laughs> you got areas that are, I mean, honestly, the whole river, a lot of the river is a big community hole. Like everybody knew Belmont is a big community hole. Acapo Beach is a big community hole. You know, Quantico Creek is a big community hole. Chicken Muscle. But you got to kind of know the spots on the spots. And it, it's going to happen. I mean, I could go out there to pre fish and somebody sees me catch a four and a half pounder and then wing another four pounder. And you best believe they're like, oh, he's about 300 yards off. I'm going to mark this hole. I mean, it, mm. it, it can happen to anybody. So I don't let it too too much bother me um, that I'm taking clients. I, most of my clients that I get are beginners. Um, they want to learn about side imaging. I know that I don't have pan optics and and active target, but there are some clients that um, that I know that want to learn how to use those products as well. Um, so not everybody is about spots, and some people just want to learn about boat and how to how to drive or. You know, so, um, or just how to cast. I Like they said, I had that 12-year-old just want to learn how to cast. And um, they had, you know, had a great time. I even, I mean, the, the kid, I felt so bad, you know what I mean? So I, I said, you know what, I'm I'm going to do something. So whatever that I was given, I, you know, I gave $40 for the tip. I gave it back to the, to the kid. You know, the dad gives it to me. I gave it to the kid. I said, hey, I want you to buy Buy that spinning rod, get yourself a little hula hoop, a uh, practice plug, and you know, you can work on your casting. So, you know, because I, I don't care about that money that day. I want them to come back. I want them to come back, and and I could be, you know, I have their kids, and they'll be wanting to come with me and guys. So, I'm trying to build a a, a relationship. You know what I mean? But um, no, going back to the original question, I, I don't let it I don't let it bother me too much as far as tournaments and stuff as far as balancing tournaments. And I guess the biggest thing is because I, I fish all over. I mean, I'm I'm on the Rappahannock. I'm on the on Anna. I mean, I'll do the saltwater thing and, you know, spots change. I mean, they'll change weekly. They change 
you know, yearly. I mean, where the grass was, you know, 15 years ago, it's not there anymore. I mean, I remember there was a huge grass field in in the middle of Mount Vernon. Now I haven't seen it like like it was in years, you know. But uh, you know, right even right now down south near Agapo Beach, it's kind of small areas with grass, but it's not the big grass flats that I would usually see. So, so it's it it changes, spots change and everything. So no, I I don't let it bother me too much. Yeah, I mean, I can see where it could, but. I don't let it bother me too much. It pushes me to find find more stuff all the time. Even the headbands yeah, had, of fishing history. Like, oh, I'm sorry, Steve. Yeah, I, I, I want to add, I used to fish tournaments, and it, I found it really difficult to fish tournaments and to guide for me personally because I started finding myself shortchanging my clients subconsciously. I didn't really, I wasn't really aware of it until I'd like, I'd go down a bank and I'd catch a fish. I'd hit, I'd hit a, a mark and then we'd go, we keep going. <laughs> you know, I'm like, what am I doing to this guy? You know, and then if I knew there was a spot that was a hot spot, I wouldn't take clients there or I would take special clients. Uh, there just, you know, that I knew weren't going to beat it up too much. They, they knew what I was doing and I would just check it and keep going. So I found it was a conflict and, um, and John Sisson and I have talked about it. Chris and I have talked about it. You know, you just, you do the best you can for that client that day. And for me, it meant I can't fish tournaments anymore. It's hard. I mean, I know I, 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 uh, Jeff Green's episode, uh, the upper Potomac will drop tomorrow. And I talked to him about that too. It's like, why don't you fish tournaments? And he's like, I just want to focus just on being the best guide possible. And I know if I go out in a tournament, I might not make my money back. Whereas like, and I'm trying to do this for a living. And the way he says like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like, yeah, this is your job. And this is how you put food on the table for your family. And a tournament still is to an extent gambling. But he also said, what was interesting, just fishing history. And he said like, I don't know if I could fish the moment on a place in a tournament if I'm out here every single day. And I, I really thought about that with you guys out there all the time. How the hell do you stay in the moment? When you're there every single day and you have so much history, the mind game's got to be insane. For me, it's a, it's a clock. It, it, as Chris mentioned, the tides and everything, not only for navigation, but for me, for, for fishing. I, I will be out fishing a spot and I'll see the next day I'll show up and I, I'll see a guy there that was watching me. And he'll be at, at that spot as I drive by it. And I'll tell my clients, we're coming back here in an hour. That guy will be gone because he won't catch anything. That that spot will be right. So as far as fishing the moment goes, I'm still every year, you know, even though I might, might fish most of the same spots because I don't fish as much grass as guys do because there isn't much above Mount Vernon anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, when it was, you know, we would do the silly thing and then we'd find the spot within the spot and, and that kind of thing. But I fish a lot of hard cover spots and I fish a lot of docks. I fish uh, wood, you know, lay downs. I fish places that are so unique. They're, they're, they're mm -hmm. one of a kind. I mean, that whole Bell Haven Dyke Marsh area is very unique. And when I do get a guy who wants to, who's a tournament angler, I'll just tell him, I'll say, look, I'm not going to help you as much being a tournament angler. Why don't you fish with, and then I'll make a recommendation mm. uh, uh, for somebody else uh, to take, take them out fishing because I'm not the guy. Uh, and, and really most of those guys that want to come out, they just want spots. And so, you know, I'll say, look, give me, give me 400 bucks. We'll go out and have coffee and, and, you know, get one of George Martin's maps and, and we'll mark it all up for you. And then you don't have to go around. You don't have to listen. You know, we could just do this in an hour. Um, but uh, I have taken some guys uh, out fishing. The only the exceptions I made recently were the, uh, I guess it was the all American that they had on the Potomac about four or five years ago. Is that it, Chris? Mm -hmm. I took yeah, a guy yeah. who to go into DC and I fished. I don't fish DC because number one, it, it requires an extra license, which means my mm -hmm. clients would have to buy that because I can't cover them. But the biggest thing is that you get pulled over all the time, you know, especially during the week when they've got nothing else to do and they see a, they yeah. see a come running over, they want to check everything. And, and my clients don't understand that's just routine. And uh, so they, you know, kind of wonder what's wrong with this guy's getting pulled over. But um, I did take this a uh, couple of guys and one guy in particular up in the D.C. For me, it was kind of fun because I used to fish up there uh, when I was fishing tournaments. I got a chance to check out a bunch of old spots and sh I showed him everything. I said, I said, I haven't been up here for about 10, 15 years. But <laughs> wow. I, I still remember 
and I took him and, you know, and he did well, he didn't win because I think somebody fished real close. Uh, it might've been those barges just above the bridge, I think, and, and won mm -hmm. that. <clears throat> That's crazy. Yeah. Cause it, that, that is such an interesting combo of trying to guide and just tournament just from the mindset the skills and everything it, it's so different because um steve you said it correctly it's like you got to teach you got to be a teacher first to be a guide and then you got to be almost cutthroat to to win tournaments and it's such a like you know two sides of a coin kind of deal um and, and something that came up in an interview that i thought that's been on my mind a lot is about what are the ethics that you should have as an angler when you have guides that are out there when you have people out there and I really couldn't narrow it down because I don't know if you can have blanket like rules of shiver in the water. Like the Potomac is such a unique beast with how it condenses everybody. And it's almost mm -hmm. like you, what would the rules of ethics be on the Potomac? Because you couldn't apply those to a Kerr Lake or, or could you? You, you know, um, it, you know, I, I have seen it all. I mean, I've, I mean, and it's not just bass fishermen. I mean, I've been on the lower Potomac, uh, and then Ken, uh, it's a community hole, King Copsco Point, and so it's Fred uh, on the southern tip of uh, Namanai Bay. It's a good striper area, top of water. And I've, you know, a lot of guys <clears throat> with the larger bay boats, you know, 21, 24 footers, they'll shallow water troll around it. I kid you not. I mean, I've had to stop casting. I mean, I'm spot locked down. I mean, I've literally have had to stop casting and wait for this guy to troll in like three and a half, four feet of water and just wait on him and wait for his lines to go by before I can make another cast. And had been sitting there for over an hour and guys just, I mean, literally be 20 yards off, off your bow. Um, I had an incident on on Anna during in January. Um, really? Everybody was chasing striper, and I, I promise you, it looked like it was a local guide. I'm not sure. I'm not going to get involved with that. But you know, he comes from behind me, pulls up, and literally, I had to do the same thing. I had to literally stop casting. I'm spot locked down, couldn't go anywhere. Um, and then there was another issue when I was on. I was in Quantico Creek fishing uh, tournament. Just so happened there was a BFL coming out of Smallwood. I think it was it was I think it was like the north northeast division. There was a guy from you know, New York, you know, registration, and I had one of my good friends. Now he's retired military, retired Marine Corps, and he had to calm me down because I I just couldn't believe it. I could have got a crappy jig with like fifteen pound line and could have put it right on the deck of his boat. That's how close this guy was. So, like, you know, it, it's as far as ethics on the water anymore, it, it's really a personal thing because a lot of these guys, a lot of them, I'm, I'm hoping that um, the culture can change, man. I really do. And I, I'm honestly, I'm hoping that, that, that panoptics and active talking will do that for us, get people from beating the bank up, maybe spread guys out. But, but no, that, that's what's going on, man. There's just, there's not a lot of ethics. People start seeing money over, over you know just being a nice guy or being a great competitor man and um you know i had a i had an incident on national semifinals and i kind of tried to um sway my my buddy away from it you know because i wasn't trying to, i was trying to not to like give him everything and he just happened that he guessed the same spot that i was going and i was a little upset but then i said well i can see kind of what happened so um, but no, and, and we ended up sharing the spot and there was no issues like that. And if somebody came on me like that and said, Hey, you know, you mind if we, you know, we do, we come this close or give us 30 yards more than likely me, myself, man, I'll give it to them because I, I respect those that respect me. So if somebody just asked, Hey, you know, you mind if I, you know, come past you or go, I'm cool with that. I'm fine. I'm the easy person to work, get along with, man. Just, just be kind. That's all. That's so for yeah, the issue I've had, uh, you know, as a guide is that people kind of know I do this for a living. Uh, they mm -hmm. should know. And yet they will not only show up on my spots. I mean, if I've got five trips in a row, I'm going to the same spots, basically, yep. or, or adding new ones if there's, if, you know, filling in with some that don't work. Um, but when they find out I'm fishing a certain spot, not only do they show up, 
but they tell everybody at the boat launch where I'm fishing. Like it's, uh, you know, oh boy, look how smart I am. I know where Steve's fishing and, and <laughs> Captain Steve's spot. Yeah, go there. He'll, he catches fish there. Otherwise he wouldn't be there. But one thing I've noticed about tournament fishing, because I cover tournaments and I'm in press boats and kind of watching, power poles have changed a lot of what goes on in, mm. in a tournament because it used to be like, well, where are you fishing? I saw you here. You're No, my power poles are down or I'm spot locked. I'm right here. And it's also changed how people catch fish because I, when the power pole thing first came about, um, I, I can't remember that Vatalero, Vic Vatalero was, uh, was fishing right there at Mount Vernon. And he had a spot that everybody kind of knew about this little teeny little spot in the grass bed. And Larry had his, or Vic had his, uh, his power poles down and that meant no, and his trolling motor up, nobody could come. And he made for, for two days, he made that's, the that's same uh... cast <laughs> two days, two days, every cast. And I would, I'd go by there and watch him from the shoreline. I'd watch him from a press boat. And all these boats were moving around. I said, I said, Vic, yes, that had to drive me crazy. And he was like leading into the last day. But he said the, the best thing was everybody was moving around in the grass and he had a quiet zone. And all mm. these fish were coming into his quiet zone and he was able to catch them. What failed him was day three and day four where they cut the field down. He didn't have as much boat traffic and he didn't have, you know, the guys herding the fish to him. So that's been a good thing. But I've seen, too, and I've written about this for Bass Fan. Uh, there was a big controversy on the Potomac. A, a guy was, like, in second place on a big tournament. Yeah, and FLW, to fish I think, spot, yeah. And a guy, yeah, a guy that wasn't even fishing uh, the, the tournament came in and started casting across his line, driving his boat through the spot. And, you know, other guys would probably, it would have been a little bit more of a I don't know how that pro angler kept his cool, but uh, uh, he did, and uh, and yet it became a big story. And when I was asked to write the piece about it, I asked everybody because the story came to be from anglers who were watching it, seeing it happen. They said this is a story. The bass fan said, "Hey, we want you to cover it. We want you to get both sides." And I did, and I just reported what happened. Um, so you have that too. So you have extremes out there, and and. I think Thomas, you and I have talked about this before. I'm wondering if the young guys will, I mean, even younger than Chris, will, will have will have the kind of integrity that it takes. Hey, man, you were here first. Or, hey, can I fish your spot? Like Chris said, I would do the same thing. Yeah, come on in. You know, just give me a little bit of room here and you can, you can fish. I don't know if these guys are, will do that, uh, the young guys. They haven't, you know, because they haven't put any blood and sweat into the into bass fishing they they went to college they fished a little bit of com competition there they graduate mommy daddy go here's 30 grand go out and play for a year or two they go out and they don't have they don't have anything to win or lose they're just out there you know having fun pretending like they're you know professional bass fishermen while there are real people out there like chris and and like me you know guiding or or fishing uh you know pot tournaments trying to you know pick up a few bucks here and there that we do this for mm -hmm. a living for us, our families, and our sponsors. And yeah. that's something I want to cut through is it seems like there's so many unwritten rules. And if you're going to play baseball, we have the same rule book we're playing by that we have the umpires that they make sure that we stay between those lines. In fishing, I, I want to make sure we bring them up to be able to teach the younger group. Like, this is what you need to do and obey. And, and so I throw it to you guys. Like, if you are in Woman or if you're at the beach at a grass flat, how much distance do or should you try to keep between your fellow competitors? What would be a good rule of thumb for young anglers to abide by in these big community holes? Because I get it. Like, a lake is a, probably a little bit different. But what would you suggest? I mean, I I feel man, it's hard. I, I yeah, feel good. it's hard. It, it's 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 really hard. It's really hard. Um, it sometimes it depends on the spot. Some you know, I mean, the way I feel. I mean, if I could if I could cast and I can hit your boat, then you're too close. That, that's just how I feel, you know. But you know, like I said, you can pull up on Aquapo Beach, Belmont, those areas in the spring. Uh, you know, some of these larger tournaments. I mean, you you're gonna have I mean, you're gonna have you're gonna have 20 30 i mean it, it, it looks like a, a freaking platoon i mean there's 30 mm -hmm. 40 boats around it and you know but, but i remember when i first started fishing and Acapo was like man it's one of one of the first spots everybody go to and i i kid you not there were 30 boats sitting around nobody complained 
Nobody said nothing. Everybody was respectable. Um, you know, might have a little shout here and there one time. And I know there was, there was a certain angler that I got into it with. Um, and everybody knew they called a lineage dock or whatever, man. And, you know, I came on the other side of the dock, but I was going to go past. And you know, one prolific angler, you know, got in, got into it. I, you know, I, I didn't fight it. I said, okay, my bad. I, you know, I pulled off over here and said, you know, I'm fine with that. If you let me know, you're respectable about it. I mean, or I'll, I'll ask, hey, you you know, do you mind? But, no, I mean, for me, I don't know, 30, 40 yards, I guess. I mean, you know, like a good cast distance, is, it, I think, it, is respectable. It's hard. Yeah. And I know yeah. this is something we got to figure out to be able to do at high school seminars to teach these kids. Because if I see Steve going down a row of docks, I know, okay, okay, this is what he's visually fishing. I need to give him a space. But then if it's a massive grass bed, it just feels like it's yeah. all bets are off and people are going to bump into each other. I think that's where yeah. the issues. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. The best thing to do is to communicate. You get yeah. out there, pull up, like, like with the dock situation or with a grass bed situation, you come up and you say, Hey, how you doing there? Uh, I'm fishing this tournament. You fishing it too? Great. Hey, I'd like to fish around here. Where, where would be a good place for me to fish? You know, let's, let's do that because I see it again, tournament anglers, they try to like ignore that you're coming up, but they're also like getting ready to throw an elbow out if they can. <laughs> they, they, they don't want you. They don't want you there. And they, they try not to establish eye contact. It, it starts off with a contentious relationship just because yeah. of the way that people come into these spots. And uh, I have not uh, uh, purposely, I have not uh, fished the crowded grass beds, but I have fished uh, like in Broad Creek. We have, uh, we have barges on the South side of Broad mm -hmm. Creek. There's one barge that everybody loves to fish. So I came in with clients that had fished with me before and they wanted to fish the barges. And I said, okay, well, so I go up to, you know, cut, got off a pad, got on my trolling motor, said, Hey buddy, I, you know, guy was fishing there. I said, uh, I said, I see you're fishing this, this barge, you're fishing it all the way. Around. Yeah. Yeah. I'm fishing the whole thing. And I go, okay, well, there's a couple more down here a little further. Would you mind if I went down there? No, nah, no, nah, go ahead. Go ahead. You got to have that. You know, and we'd start catching fish. The guy would then come over, try to fish the barges that we we're fishing. And I said, oh, remember you have that one over there? You know, remember that? We made that that deal. And that yep. usually puts it to bed. Uh, but I think a little more communication. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there are no written rules. I think there used to be one about, you, you know, anchored trolling motor up yeah, uh, yeah. There, there's one for that but other than that and it used to be uh for the pros on the potomac oh that's jay yellis's spot everybody knew where it was that was jay's if he showed up for that you know bass master series that that was his spot nobody would bother it and, and that kind of thing but you're right i i don't know how you educate the kids that have one year under their belt mm -hmm. they they fished a lot they want to fish tournaments and now they're out there and what they see is like like the Pennsylvania anglers coming to uh, coming to the Potomac. You know, they yep. they can't fish their fisheries mm -hmm. because they're they're closed. So they all come there. That and from Jersey, they come down and they're very aggressive, and they'll get yep. right on top of you. And they go like, "Hey, community hole. Well, what does that mean? That you, you want to yeah. be in my boat with me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what you know, yeah I I can't pitch a crappie jig as as far as Chris can, but if I smell <clears throat> their suntan lotion, then I go, "You're too close. You know, you're <laughs> close enough. You know, you're yeah. I, I smell Hawaiian tropic. You're too close. Get get away." But uh, I try to avoid that, and that's one of the reasons I quit fishing on weekends. I just won't. Yeah. Uh, won't book trips on Saturday or Sunday because it's just not, um, it's not worth it. Um, I've even had situations. I, I did a, a TV thing with uh, Mariko Izumi. I can't remember the name of her show, but she came and she, uh, she wanted to catch four fish and she's an average fisherman. She wanted to catch four fish and it was on a weekend, 4th of July weekend. And uh, we went out there and I was catching them, but she just couldn't quite get them. And I said, look, I got this one spot. And I pulled up and it was a guy that I knew from the marina that I launched at. And I said, look, we just need one fish. Can I go over and fish that little spot there? And he waved me off, said, no, no, I've got this. You fish out there. So we had to back up and fish. Uh, it's, uh, there isn't really a lot of courtesy out there. Uh, I think you'll find that, that the guides, I know Chris real well, and I know that Chris and every guide I've, I've worked with, 
uh, Jeff, uh, you mentioned Jeff, uh, you know, um, we, Jeff Green, everybody, we're all very courteous. We, you know, we talk to people, hi, how you doing? It also helps us establish boundaries and say, this is where I'm fishing. Uh, that's where you're fishing. I, I also feel like people that aren't in the know try to lump in guides and, and tournament anglers, and they're two different breeds because it generally mm -hmm. seems like, at least from the conversations I've had across fisheries, guides generally have a camaraderie or respect for each other that we're, this is how we make our living where it seems like it's the weekend warriors that the guys that actually think they're Mike Iconelli when it's like, dude, you haven't even won a BFL yet. Those are yeah. the people that create a lot of this issue and friction on a Saturday morning. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's gotten, it's gotten really bad though. I mean, and I mean, I, I hope I don't sound bad saying this. I mean, I hope it's not like a Randy Blunkett move, movement, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> I mean, you you got a lot of guys, man. That like, I mean, dude. I mean, I swear, man. I mean, you will swear them down, man. They, I mean, they got rap boot, rap this, rap that, man. I tell you, they got more sponsors, man, than than Kevin Van Dam. And it's like, you know, what have you kind of done? And they push themselves there, like they're this and they're that. And it's like, man. You know, are you putting the work in? I the, the days of the guys that were sponsored, that you went to the tackle stores, you went to Bobcats, you went to Fred Sporting Goods, you went to all these areas. Those old school guys, man, it's like we're a dying breed. And now you have a whole – and I'm not hating, man. It's just the, the direction the sport is going now, man. Now it's like, man, if you can have – you know, 10,000 people checking out checking out your TikTok video, oh, my God, man, we'll, we'll – We'll, we'll throw a thousand crankbaits to you, man. Just just put us on on your on your website, you know, and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, um, it, it no that the whole game, man, of, of, of fishing sponsorship, all, all that is just it's changed tremendously, man. It's changed tremendously, and it's got its good and it's got its bad. You know what I mean? I recognize that a lot of people are definitely using social media, um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, all that, um, even your own personal website. Uh, it, you know, the game is changing, man, and the anglers are changing. I mean, there's kids out here now, you know, fishing the, uh, the opens, man, fishing nine day on tournaments, and it's like, shoot, you're like 19 years old. It's like, how much marketing experience do you have at like 18, 19 years old? You don't, um, but you're just, you're, you're funding it with debt or, or mom and dad's money. And it's just not, yeah. a, it's not a good business model. And we're going to be entering if we're not in a recession. So I, I, it's going to be scary. Like for some of these people that are trying to make it, like, how are you going to be able to like pay your mortgage payments? Yeah. Or, yeah. Or your school loans. Yeah. Yeah. You school loans. Loan. <clears throat> right. You know, and yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the only thing that's, that's, really to me that's been a big change in the industry man i mean steve's captain steve's knows man he's been in this industry long enough i mean back in the day i mean you could get a, a starter 18 foot bass boat for you know 24 23 grand back in the 90s now i mean you, you don't even look at a boat unless you're talking 40 grand on up um any boat even aluminum now so it, it, it it's definitely it's changed man and technology has changed you know with live scoop i mean power poles i mean by the time you talk all that stuff you're already talking almost ten thousand dollars in extras you know lithium batteries but you no know, the sport is just it's changing i mean it's changing it's very technological compared to what it was in the um, early 2000s like when i started man and and you know it's just definitely changed and i know it's you know i could have captain steve been been my God, man, he was guy, he was guy. I was learning how to use a baitcaster, man. So I know he's seen a lot of changes in this thing, man. But it's it's uh, but no, it's it's, it's, it's changing. I still like you. <laughs> I love you too, man. <laughs> uh, and and yet the Potomac can still kick them out, which is insane to me. And, and yeah. e even with all the um the fun controversy that I get to listen to about the in industrial netting and the catfish and all this other stuff, I it should not be as good as it is. It really shouldn't when you go down the list of craziness. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, I've done studies over the past 25, 30 years and it's, it's, it was 15 pounds to win a, a multiple day tournament. 
it's still 15 pounds a day to win a multiple day That's tournament. Stupid. So it hasn't, it hasn't gotten bad. It, you know, Maryland hasn't really, you know, squawked a lot about, uh, about the, the fishery and, and changing limits. Uh, Virginia still sees, you know, pretty good fishing, uh, you know, bass are doing, doing well. Um, I think that the only thing that anglers need to, to do is to take better care of their fish, because I want them to keep in mind that, the fish you're bringing back to the weigh-in, those are the biggest fish in the river. Mm -hmm. Those are the biggest mm -hmm. ones. And if you don't take care of those big fish, then yeah. you'll, you'll be whining saying, well, we have plenty of fish, but they're all two or three pounders. Uh, and now this thing with the Alabama bass, I, I don't, you know, don't need to belabor it, but uh, you start adding those in the mix, who knows what will happen. But the Potomac is great. It's, it, it accommodates, in, for me, it's great because it accommodates any fishing level. If you're a high level guy and you know like to skip jigs under docks, uh, I got a place for you. If you're a beginner and, and just learning how to cast, I got a place for you. I, so the Potomac is wide open. Uh, it, it, it offers shallow water fishing, uh, so you don't have to like be looking for that one rock in 50 feet of water. You just you find a grass, <laughs> pick, pick it apart, and you'll do fine. Uh, find some docks, you'll do fine. So you could fish however you want, mm. and it's you, it shows with the number of tournaments that that are you know coming here. Now, I don't know why we don't have the elites coming here. They they're going to the upper bay though. Um, the upper bay, yeah, yeah. that's what it is, <laughs> Thomas. It is about the money, but it's also uh, a little bit about uh, they they had a sort of a bad taste in their mouth from um, you know from years back when when the DNR was changing all the rules for everybody but mm. yeah it's uh upper bay is putting the money out there charles county is not so um that's the biggest reason we don't have the the big and the fishing is somewhat better from what i hear from some of the guys but heck i've never had any of my clients complain about the potomac river you know people that fished with me 20 25 years ago they still want to fish this year so it's uh it is a fun place to fish. And I actually uh, was teasing one of my uh, writer buddies, John Neparandi, who's uh, pretty well known. He writes pretty much everything, uh, bass, crappie, catfish. He does, he's multi-species writer. And he wrote about a guy that said these were his three baits that he uses and he posted on Facebook. And I said, that's great. You should have asked me, John, because my three baits are, are a chatter bait uh, or, or a lipless bait. And a baby one minus. Those are my three baits that I'm using this time of the year. And uh, so he sent, sent me a note back. He goes, all right, I'll write about you. So, uh, you know, eventually we'll have an article written and, and get something done that way. You got to needle them a little bit. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not too upset that bass is not coming here. I think it was like last year where the James had like the bass open, the FLW Toyota tackle warehouse series thing, and two other big tournaments. And it just gets the snot pounded out of it. And so it's almost, I think a blessing where you don't have all these big tournaments and just letting this place kind of like gear back up, because I feel like something's going to happen in a good way with the weights here in the next couple of years. It feels like everything's trending in the right way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think fish displacement is, is real. Um, but I think when people talk about the spawn, um, I think a lot of fish will find other beds to kind of, you know, take over. Um, I, I've experienced, I remember, was it was last year, Toyota Series was in June, I think. Yeah. That, that multi-day. And me and my buddy, uh, Jeff Mead, we were fishing Quantico. We had a good, we had a really good day there. I mean, it was blowing up the frog or whatever. Um, then they had the Toyota series there. I think there was a BF up between that two, man. And we came back there two weeks later. I promise you, man, you would swear that somebody hauled saying the whole creek. I mean, we didn't get a bite all day. That was a good friend of mine, Michael Cole, great angler. He didn't get a bite there all day. It's like, what in the world is going on? And it's not like you're getting a lot of movement during the summertime. I mean, they're, they're not moving around a whole lot. They'll try to look for shade, a lot try to look for grass, and they don't have dots. But man, I mean, you know, you get most of your movement on bass from the, in the fall time because you're chasing bait. They're more unpredictable, but you got to find that bait. Then the springtime is all about springtime transition, you know, following where they're going to eventually spawn. Sometimes they shouldn't move that much, but man, I mean, it was like someone took a hall saying and just, just sweep that whole creek. And then what do you find out? 
at the dock. Yeah, we called him up pretty good. The matter woman was like, yeah, you catching all of the retreads, <laughs> you know. So, and there was a, actually, a, a, I think, a study or whatever. It was in, done in Texas. And I forgot the guy um, that's online. He's just pretty good. And he was talking about how long it takes a bass to move from area A to area B or whatever. And, yeah, it does take a lot while. If you catch a bass in, in Blue Plains, you know what I mean, I don't think that bass is going to swim to spawn from Mad Woman Creek to Blue Plains. But they'll find in a suitable area where they'll try to fertilize eggs or find another suitable mate or whatever. So, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, then, you know, I think Captain Steve has even heard about it. You know, I, I kind of like what the ABA, I think the program is doing with the five fish for the boaters and three, three fish for the yeah. co-angler. That's a good um, idea. I like that. I, I don't think that's a bad idea. I tell you the truth. This is just me, me personally. I mean, for a small period or, um, you know, March to June, maybe doing a three fish or if, if these series want to come make at least one of those tournaments, a three fish deal, um, just to protect them. Cause guys are going to call, they're gonna call in those same areas where where they they're being caught. You know, they're gonna go right back. So it's it's interesting. I was like, what can we do at tournament anglers to be better stewards? You know, and what that's what I did like about the uh, the pro am trail that they went with a three fish limit. So they're taking a lot of stress off of keeping them in alive for all day, um, and there's more room and stuff. So, you know, three three fish limit. I mean, I. I wouldn't have a problem. It would just make you fish a little harder. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It, it, I guess, I guess it was almost turned to a big fish tournament, you know, you know, because you figure you got one good one, then you got to have two bookends to go with that. So, you know, it, it's, it would be interesting. It would be interesting. I will say, you know, what is the water quality like um, right now when you had a winter that wasn't very cold, it was very mild. And I mean, are you seeing more of an increase in bait activity? Will this be, positive or negative on like the aquatic vegetation i think it's going to be uh be positive for the aquatic vegetation um because we didn't have a lot of rain either uh, in the winter time so without a lot of wind without a lot of rain the water stays a little bit clearer and we've got a lot of grass coming up in the southern part of the river Good. and and it it will propagate with cutting so as the tide brings it in and out hopefully uh, areas that uh, haven't had grass for several years will start getting that grass. They It may not be productive this year, but it surely will if it's in the right area. Like if you have some at Mount Vernon, uh, that stretch that we were talking along the, about the, along the parkway, you get some grass showing up there, It'll the fish will stay there. Uh, you get some in, in Broad Creek and the fish will stay there. And I think this year is the year we're going to start to see more grass showing up in, in different places because it's really taken it off uh, uh, down south. And when you drive your boat through it, you're actually spreading the grass through the whole rest of the river. You mentioned yeah. something really interesting on a Facebook post a while back, which was like different grasses grow at different times of the year, I, I believe. And I'm paraphrasing it vaguely here. Yeah. Um, could you explain that a little bit more? So it's not just like all grass starts growing like like the grass on our lawn once April 1 hits. Yeah, typically the first grass to, to emerge is milfoil. And milfoil will come up and, and then followed by coontail, followed by hydrilla. Now, milfoil it has to grow early and get a lot of light and, and a lot of sunlight because it doesn't have much foliage. So it's tall and, and lanky and, and the leaves have to get up close to the surface. So if you have clear water, you don't have a lot of silt and sediment in the water, those, those grass beds will establish and they'll clear the water making the way for other grasses to come up like coontail. Coontail gets a little bit more, uh, I guess, tangled up. It's, it's more of a wiry type of grass. It's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a little harder to fish with moving lures because it's a little more snaggy. Uh, and then you have, uh, you have hydrilla. Now, hydrilla usually comes in later. It comes hmm. in June you because know, it, needs, it needs to have a little bit more light. Now, hydrilla interestingly enough, is called the uh, the gateway grass because what it does is it actually, it's a pioneer grass actually, and it, it will clear the water so that those cuttings that we were talking about of the milfoil, even though they didn't get established in March and April like we wanted them to, they'll get established in 
June, July, and August. They may not be huge grass beds, but they'll go dormant. So the following year, we'll end up having more grass. So the easiest grass for us to fish is, is milfoil. That's our favorite type of grass because it grows kind of like in stalks, sometimes in bunches of two or three. And you see three bunches and you drop it in between them. You'll usually have, have a bass that's bedding in those. Uh, I also like to fish what I call the fingers where you can drop a bait right through the fingers and it's going to go down the stalk down to the bottom and that's where you're going to catch a fish or if you're swimming a jig in that in that milfoil you catch that milfoil snap it and just let it go down because that's going to put you down right to to the base of that milfoil so the grasses do come up at different times they each have a have a purpose you, you fish them a little bit differently uh the milfoil will clear the water and will provide the best cover in March, April, May, hmm. and then May, June, July, you take over the coontail and the, and the hydrilla. And the hydrilla kind of grows like a carpet. It, it grows along the bottom and that becomes very difficult to fish because it grows towards the sun and leaves a bunch of stalks uh, underneath it. So you could have a cavern underneath that i mean a solid mat of hydrilla but it doesn't fish like a like a milfoil mat because there are no real holes in it it's just like this whole cavern uh and they've done studies in, in florida of course uh university of florida have done a lot of studies with bass fishing and they say that the bass are under the hydrilla mats it's just where you can't figure out where because it's just the same thing but with milfoil you it's it's architecturally different and you can see that that yeah, the first times I saw, uh, I saw uh, Greg Hackney and uh, particularly Greg Hackney and um, Kelly Jordan, uh, they were punching mats and nobody was punching mats before. And we, we had no idea what that was. And they had, we had the grass in the Potomac for all the years and, uh, and, and they were doing it. And it was baffling a lot of people how they picked out spots. And if you start to look at at a, at a grass bed and start to look, I call it the tennis ball pattern. You can write this down, tennis ball pattern. Remember that. <laughs> tennis balls, tennis balls. Every time I saw a tennis ball, I'd say to a little kid, I said, look, look, there's a, a, a tennis ball there. I guess, uh, I guess whoever uh, made that throw, the guy didn't catch it. And uh, they go, or they were playing with their dog and the dog got tired of chasing it. And I'm like, okay, whatever it is, right? But the tennis ball pattern, if it floats, then you got sticks, you got everything else. And what happens is all the dead stuff starts to decompose. The crawfish get around those mats. They start to eat the decomposing stuff, mm -hmm. whether it's other fish or whatever they're eating. And that's where the bass are. They're underneath mm -hmm. it. They're looking up. So when you punch those areas, your percentages go up. Now, I, I saw guys, co-anglers in boats with these guys. And I'd say, so uh, Hackney was uh, punching mats. What you, What'd you learn? I don't know. He was just throwing it here, throwing it there. So then you ask Hackney, where are you throwing it? And he starts telling you stuff like that. He didn't come up with the tennis ball, but he was talking about how the stalks of milfoil will collect all that stuff and then become mm -hmm. like, and that'll anchor it there. So you're looking for, you know, in a big area, you're looking for those. And you're also looking for a little a clump that's away from the major grass clump. And it's best it's best to fish at higher tides because it, it, it allows that stuff to, to really sit up there and block the sun. Mm -hmm. And you want to be out there during the hottest part of the day so it'll drive those fish under there. You get a breeze or some clouds, that pattern doesn't, doesn't work. What were the best years for grass on the river? Are those behind us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've not had... I, I, Chris, I don't know. The northern part of the river has not participated in, yeah. in grass. Yeah. yeah, there used to be a grass flat that was above the Wilson Bridge, went yeah. all the way to the Blue Plains and went down below the Wilson really? Bridge, all the way past the National Harbor. Oh, yeah. yeah, there'd be like 30, 40, but I never had, I would just idle out of Bell Haven and I'd start fishing and I would just go around it by time. Time I got all the way around. That was an eight-hour trip. Let's go home, you know. That's and crazy. Uh, the grass beds were incredible. You had grass growing in in Smoot Bay, which is National Harbor. You don't have had grass there for a long time. Um, have some grass growing in um, in uh, uh, Spoils Cove, not much. Used to have a lot of grass at Blue Plains. You mentioned Blue Plains. The flat that was around Blue Plains was was surrounded with yep, grass. Surrounded. You could go all the way into uh, D.C., Chris. We were going, I mean, what, what's that channel with the military base? Uh, 
um, Washington Channel. The Washington Channel, uh, that, yeah. Yeah, that place was solid grass up through there, too. I mean, there was grass everywhere. That grass hasn't been around for five, ten years now. So half the river doesn't have grass, and we talked about crowds. It's putting, yep. you know, there yep. you go. Everybody in grass beds, and uh, they beat them up during the week, and they beat them up on the weekend. If you're a recreational angler, it makes it a little bit tough for you, um, which is kind of like what I, I like to do, what I what I do uh, up north, because I my hard cover is there. I know where it is. I know when to fish it. So it works out for me. That's why I think a lot of a lot, a lot of the guys that remember when there wasn't any grass on the river, I think that's what makes them so much a better fisherman. Because mm. and then you're seeing you're seeing a lot of the tournament anglers, you're seeing a big flip flop sometimes. So you got some guys that are like great grass fishermen. Then you have guys that fish more up north, where it ain't gonna be a whole lot of change. Because I mean, a piece of concrete is just gonna be a con piece of concrete, you know, ten years later. Right. But gr grass is so cyclical that it'll it'll change. Like right now, I mean, I'm I'm fishing. I've been launching out of Potomac Creek, and then. Fishing Potomac Creek, and I'm I'm seeing areas with grass. Um, um, where uh, I forget the, the Italian guy that won that tackle warehouse. Uh, Gelato, yeah, gelato, Gagliard. something like that. Gelato, yeah. So I call it gelato. <laughs> 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 but that, but there's a little bit of grass growing in there. But then you come towards the front of Potomac Creek, I'm not seeing as much grass. I go to the front of a Acapo Beach. There's a little little smaller area that I had that I caught fish early back in like early March and, and now that's gotten a little bigger but there's still areas that I, I'm seeing like pieces of old hydrilla that hadn't been ripped off the bottom seabed but I'm seeing some Eurasian mill for the same time then I can go inside of a choir I'll have a bay that will have sparse grass then I'll fish in an area um Near the mouth of a quad, I'm not kidding you. I could barely run a chatterbait through it. It's just so so thick. So it it and Arkendale Flats. I think Camp um, Steve knows about Arkendale. Arkendale's a good place. Been in that game for years. Arkendale was a good early springtime area, and right now there ain't a whole lot of grass there. But were guys fishing the grass, or were they fishing you know the marsh banks that diverted a lot of the river channel? So I think a lot of those guys that fished in the 90s and and before when there weren't a lot of grass they knew what to kind of look for they knew that hard cover and i i gotta say this is just my opinion i think a lot of hard cover guys are better fishermen because they can fish it with there's no grass and if you add grass man that just that just that just adds to the to the salad so to speak so i think um I think this year, I'm I'm hoping that this is going to be a great grass year. Like Captain Steve was saying, man. I mean, even Lake Anna. I mean, I don't know, Thomas. I I mm -hmm. was at the back. Yeah, I was at the back of North Anna River, and dude, I mean, you could throw a jerk bait. I think even uh, um, one of the local guys, uh, Chris McCotter, was even writing about it. And it's true. I have never seen the back of North Anna. I mean, I'm way back in Wadis and those areas. I mean, I've never seen waterways so pristine and clear and i think that can change um that's going to change the game as far as spawn too maybe they'll spawn a little deeper because they feel like hey you know it's not just you know bluegill and all the predatory that they got to worry about but they also got to worry about the birds up above too so it may make them spawn a little deeper so it's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting year on the river for sure i know odin Definitely. kirk fights them a lot on lake anna because he wants to have more uh subaquatic vegetation at lake anna but you're just you're fighting those homeowners associations and it's such a pain in the butt there yeah. because and and this is again what when you interview like river keepers and talk to them about the health of a fishery and mm -hmm. I really wish we could get more anglers instead of bitching about, you know, the blue cats and things like that. Let's talk more about like the water quality and the subaquatic vegetation and how we get that back. Because why is it DC hasn't had grass grown in 10 years? That's concerning. Cause if grass doesn't want to grow there, there's something wrong with the water. <laughs> well, no, and a lot of it too, Thomas is increased boat activity. Oh, um, true. You know, when the, the grass was there, when they built the new Wilson bridge, it was right after that that it disappeared. Oh. So, so you'll hear you'll hear uh, biologists saying, "Well, you know, we had an ice age," or "Yeah, that come up with something and <laughs> why, why we lost it." 
<laughs> but I can tell you because I fish that area a lot, and when they when they were building that bridge, they were building it 24 hours a day. They had dredged the channel below the Wilson Bridge, and they were running a barge uh, from a concrete factory that they built in Smoot Bay just for the bridge. They're running barges back and forth, back and forth, 24 hours a day. They had that place. It was chocolate milk. The year after this, they 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 broke ground in November, whatever year that was. They broke ground in November, dredged that channel. The grass came back the following year, and that was it. We never had grass on that flat since. That grass flat was the most important grass flat on the that end of the river because it extended above the bridge and below the bridge. And you had channels mm -hmm. on the Virginia side and the Maryland side. Yep. That's like a big filter. Mm -hmm. That filtered yep. the water. And like I said, what, what, what it takes to get grass to grow is you've got to have clear water. And no matter what you do, you're going to have muddy water coming out of the, the north end of the river because that's where everything comes down. It funnels down. Now it's not filtered at all. And I saw it year after year, further south, every year, further south, the grass wouldn't grow. Further south, further south, further south. And now Doe Creek used to be full of grass. Full of it. In Doe Creek. I mean, there was so much grass in Doe Creek, you couldn't even, at low tide, you could see it was just all, almost the whole creek was grass. And you had just a little yeah. narrow channel. Uh, Pohick is, has got grass now. Maybe now it, that grass will start to move its way north, but we got to have all the conditions that are right. The person that you should have on your show is Nancy Rabicki. Uh, Nancy Rabicki, uh, USGS, and she knows more about SAVs than anybody else. And uh, she's a wonderful lady. She'd be a really good guest if you want to just break down and have yes. someone that just really gets into the grass. Uh, she's an excellent guest. Uh, I'm sure John Odenkirk has her phone number. Uh, wonderful lady. Uh, ran into her at Bell Haven one day. And she just, uh, I, I'd met her several times before. In fact, I'd worked with her on the water chestnuts when we were pulling water chestnuts out of Poland. Yeah. I and, remember that. Yeah, remember that? So we were pulling mm -hmm. water chestnuts, and I met her then, and I'd met her at, uh, used to be National Fishing and Boating Day in D.C. We would have, like, some inner-city kids come out to Constitution Gardens and try to teach them how to fish and have a good time. And so Nancy was just a wonderful lady. Well, I hadn't seen her for several years, and I was at Bell Haven, and she came by, and she said, oh, uh, you fish out here a lot, don't you? I said, yes, ma'am, I do. She goes, how are the SAVs doing? Now, not many people will say SAV. Mm -hmm. They'll say, we'll say it, you know, fishermen will say it, but this, I didn't understand. And after I talked to her, I said, are you Nancy Rubicki? She goes, of course, Steve, you don't remember me? And I'm like, I'm sorry. But <laughs> I've talked to her many, many times, and she knows, she knows more about the grasses. And in fact, it was interesting that uh, um, the National Park Service built a jetty in Dyke Marsh. I, I don't know if you've talked about this or not. So this jetty goes out a thousand feet. It goes out to the Maryland line. So it hooks north. That used to be a point there a hundred years ago. And when smooth sand and gravel started excavating sand and gravel for some projects later on, I think there one of them was called the Pentagon. The other one was called the Reagan National Airport. They need to fill those marshes and they got their dredge material from there. When they took away that point and compromised the shoreline, you had a lot of erosion. So the Friends of Dyke Marsh and the National Park Service somehow got the money, tens of millions of dollars over a 20-year period, finally got that thing built. It hooks north. And what is its purpose? It's to slow the water coming out of the creeks so that the silt will deposit right there. So now you've got another reason why there isn't that much grass. When the Park Service was showing off and saying what they were going to do and explain the project. They had the media out. And one of the media people looks down the water and says, what's that grass? And they said, oh, well, that's hydrilla. That's a nuisance grass. The biologist mm. from Virginia and some of the other biologists said, no, it's not a nuisance grass. It's a pioneer grass. And it's essential. You see all the fish swimming around in it. I mean, that's how our fry survive. Because when they get in that hydrilla, and bass can't really get to them. And uh, so a lot of people discount hydrilla as it being just a nuisance, but um, it's, it is important. And you have that, that project that's going to slow all that down. We haven't had any grass there. I'm fishing spots that I never could fish before for forever. In the last five to 10 years, I've been able to fish them. In the, I used to fish them just in the spring. And then the grass would grow. The fish would move into the hydrilla. I couldn't get to them. 
now those those are I found hard cover in the middle of these bays that I never knew was there because now I'm I'm looking instead of fishing the point of the bay now I'm going into the bay where I never could fish before and I'm finding I'm finding hard cover because there's no grass. Um, it'd be good to get the grass back because I think the overall health of the of the river it would probably take uh, the pressure off of some of the bigger fish so we'd have more bigger fish. I think we have enough. But at some point with, with all the tournaments bringing back bigger fish, 20% uh, delayed mortality, you know, we're losing one fish that, uh, of every limit that we bring in. It's, yeah. Um, Chris, you muted your mic. Chris, you muted your mic. Your mic. Check your mic. Did you mute your <laughs> mic? Sorry about that. Yeah. Continue. Yeah, yeah, mic on, sorry. I was trying to read your list. I couldn't keep up. <laughs> but no, Kevin Steve said like two good points I was writing down. And one of the one of the great things he talked about was boat traffic. And one thing we didn't have several years ago, we didn't have snakehead fishermen fishermen like motoring with mm -hmm. jet motors and all different type of you know, going through propulsion, going through these grass beds, you know. So, you know, we had a guy with electric motors, you know you know, our bass fishermen, but now, you know, the snakehead fishing thing is like almost 24 seven. It's like when the bass guys are coming off the water, they're coming, you know, on, onto the water. So yeah, that boat traffic thing, I think that's a big, big thing. Um, but it should be, you know, spreading in other areas from the, from the cutters. But then the other thing, you know, that I thought about too, that's kind of odd and it's always kind of been, on my mind because um when i worked at the u.s capitol i was a i was a horticulturist up there so i kind of knew something about crashes and one of the greatest things i was trying to understand is you know usually uh, the dc area has a very high uh nutrient load you know talking nitrogen and everything else and that's one of the things grass love grasses love nitrogen as well as algae too so i'm just kind of wondering if if um the poo poo plant up north is are they pumping out less nitrogen possibly you know is it more homeowners is it the lack of using salt treatments on the roads you know so that, i mean there's like so many different um reasonings and i'm definitely in 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 agreement with what captain steve is saying too because um definitely the dredging the uh water not being as clear that's definitely a big one because if i mean they, they just won't propagate i mean if they can't get sunlight i mean it's just like putting a two by four on the ground on some very green grass well what's going to happen it's going to kill it's going to it's going to kill your grass and if that sunlight can't reach you know five six feet down in the water even three and a half feet down the water it, it's just not going to grow so um, it, it's going to be interesting this year, you know, being the water so clear, not having these big storms and stuff, and hopefully um, not getting anything crazy in that June time frame. Because a lot of times we get a lot of those uh, storms coming in and not getting a, a high flow of water um, coming down from D.C. So hopefully this this year is going to be great. Like I said, I mean, there's areas in the choir that are just, I mean, I, I think it will be top down by May. Um, it's, I mean, you can literally see it um, on a mid tide now. I mean, on the surface, so and the water is just getting clear down there. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be really interesting here on the Potomac, and not just the grass on the upper Potomac, but we're starting to see grass on the lower Potomac too that are helping really? out the crabs and helping out the speckled trout and the redfish and stuff too. So you know, all that stuff from up, you know, up north, it's definitely helping. Uh, down south too so hopefully we'll see more of the sav down in the southern areas too you know for the salt water um but we used to see a lot of the uh not the wild celery oh my god it looks like wild celery but um with in grass you're seeing a lot of that type of stuff uh, early in spring that helps with a lot of the you know white perch and those uh, smaller fish so um it, it, it's going to be it's going to be very interesting grass is definitely definitely um one of the most important things um, that we have on the river. I mean, it, it cleans the river. It's like a natural dirt filter, you know, it, you know, um, it gets all this stuff out. So 
And there was a time, man, like you'd struggle where you didn't have grass because it just wasn't clear. But then you go on the other side where you had grass, and and it was a lot easier to catch these fish. So we're just hoping that um, this grass, you know, will do well this year, and people don't start complaining and wanting to spread and everything. The next thing you know, we're gonna be like Florida where they're spraying it all. And, and that's the yeah, biggest I, thing. I, I want to add. Go for it. Can, go for it. Can I add? Yeah, to the grass situation, if you're fishing a grass bed, like Chris said, they get clearer and the fish get accustomed to feeding by, mm -hmm. by sight more than anything else. So you know that. Mm -hmm. But then weekends, we get a lot of boat activity. The, the grass pulls the water in through its leaves. The silt and sediment in the water collects on the leaves. And then on the weekend, with a boat wake moving it around, your water can get muddy again. And that's one of the things that makes it a little bit tougher for guys on the weekend is they, they go there during the week, the water's crystal clear. They go out there on the weekend, especially a, a, a Sunday tournament where they've had Saturday boaters all over mm -hmm. the place. Uh, you got National Harbor with a lot more boats going through there, people going as a destination up and down the river, these big wake monsters that go up and down the river. So what is good can turn bad real fast, which again, for me, the consistency of hard cover, doesn't matter what the water clarity is. The fish are holding tight to that cover i could put a bait right where they are when you fish in clear water it gets a little bit tougher because those fish tend not to feed as much when the water gets gets as muddy without you putting a bait right in front of them that's an excellent point excellent point and, and guys what 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 captain steve was saying earlier so um by the way, everyone that's listening should download Google Earth Pro because you can go back in time. So this is from 2018. If I skip forward two years, oh, 2019, boom, there you have it. You have this massive jetty, which is insane wow. how big it is. And that's just in a year. I didn't realize it was that fast that they wow. built that. Yeah, and they did. They, they got it built real fast. And, and the thing about it is it, it blocks... It, you know, it's curved northward, so all the water that is coming out of the creeks from up north is slowed down there, and they're trying to silt in everything north of that. That whole uh, that whole marsh area that, that eroded, and you can go back to the National Park Service uh, website, and they'll show you that the area that uh, is around those, like behind uh, Hog Island, which I, don't, I saw it there for a second. Um, go go so up. That, that's all that's all park service water and technically you're not allowed to operate an outboard motor there you're not allowed to be within 100 feet of a nesting marsh wren and even more technically you're not supposed to be using uh lead uh they've enforced it one time uh for some snakehead fishermen who are actually in the back of that that creek area the one that winds up to the oh. to the parkway and um but that whole area is supposed to be kind of like off limits i've been asked that <clears throat> by a lot of guys who uh, who want to fish tournaments, they'll, they'll go in there and they'll catch a few fish. And I'll say, well, technically, and they used to have signs. Um, I'm not sure what happened to those signs, but they uh, they kind of disappeared. And uh, mm -hmm. but that the Park Service claims that they own everything basically from from that jetty on up. I just I'm i don't know it's just just shocking like how much change it will have and what the effects will i mean this is only 2000 this is already 2021 so you're not talking a very long period of time and you're already seeing some changes just in these couple of images images um so it'll be interesting to see the the ecological <clears throat> effects of this thing in 10 years what this will actually end up yeah. doing to this place yeah and the people that live south of there and if you go a little further south you'll see a whole bunch of houses with docks they're going to be impacted as well because uh, that's going to slow that's going to slow the uh, the current flow for them and the people on the north side of that have already experienced uh, you know uh, some siltation there it's already started to take place on those two northern docks and if you go to the environmental impact study that the National Park Service did those last two docks on the northern side are actually in in National Park Service water wow. so the Park Service decided. I don't know if they've even notified those homeowners that uh, that their docks are in National Park Service land, but because uh, it that last piece that's on the the last piece of that parcel was donated to the Park Service, I think about five or six years ago, and uh, even then those docks were on. In fact, there used to be a fence that all used to be land through there and it eroded. There used to be a fence row that went across there. I mean, I. I don't think a lot of people know much about that particular area of the river, 
like I said, it's uh, I fish it a lot, and it is the most unique area on the river because it's the only area that's eroded that much uh, over a span of 20 or 30 years. I mean, I, I see it eroding every every year that I'm out there. Uh, more and more trees are being, uh, you know, sucked into the river and they're falling here. You've got tree stumps that are 50 yards out from the shoreline wow. because that used to be land. Wow. And, uh, and I'm not going to show you exactly where those are. <laughs> <laughs> but, th- but that's insane because like this place up there I, I just know from people that are out of town that ask me about this area it's the wild west when you get up to dc it is such a weird animal that place it really is but you're right anything that you do up there affects the rest of the river if you dig a bridge if you do anything that has a huge trickle down effect to the rest of the river and people have got to know this and stop bitching about the blue catfish or whatever these are the topics that you really should be raising cane about not the catfish it's yeah. the water quality habitat. yes the habitat. habitat it affects everything yeah i don't know yeah it's a lot of guys uh are the ones that are complaining about stocking or you know virginia's not stocking or maryland's not stocking you can't just put fish where they where they have no habitat mm-hmm. you can't do that you can put them there i mean you know i fish a lot in west virginia and they have these lakes they put trout into and everybody runs down and they catch a trout like hey i caught trout well they were just released in a truck an hour ago i mean if that's what you want <laughs> you know then your dnr is going to do that now they can't put in they've been putting in um uh, hatchery fish but they're putting in two or three inch fish so that's basically they're putting in food mm-hmm. uh and without the habitat those fry don't have a chance like yep. i said that hydro that everybody thinks is so evil uh you folks at lake anna that that think that's a bad thing it actually helps those fish grow yep. and and you end up with a bigger population now i you know at lake anna they also had some water quality issues too and i'm not sure uh, I wonder it, why. It was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, Chris was talking about the stuff that people put fertilizers, stuff like that. Well, too much of it is is with the algae is not a good thing, and I, yeah. they had that that algae out there. But uh, yeah, it, it, without knowing how to fish grass, you're you're in trouble when you come to the Potomac because you don't have time to find mm-hmm. all these spots. I mean, literally thirty years of fishing from Mount Vernon North and, you know, and 40 years of fishing in Little Hunting Creek or 50 years of, geez, 50 years of fishing in Little Hunting Creek. I mean, I, I, I mean, I know, I mean, I was fishing Little Hunting Creek in, in the late sixties uh, out of a John boat. So I know that, I know that Creek better than the beavers know it because they just <laughs> moved in. You know, I've, I know that place real well. But if you don't if you don't know those spots and you come to the Potomac or if you're a weekend angler, you either have to start really paying your dues or like a lot mm-hmm. of the pros do. Mm-hmm. And I don't like this. What they do is they, they go, OK, who are the guides? I want to know the guides and they'll follow. The, I had guy follow me. I'm not going to mention his name either, but he follows and he's got a reputation for doing that. He followed me out. He kept asking people. And people were going, hey, there's some guy with a, a raft boat looking for you. And they told me his name. And so I tried to avoid him. And then one day he courted me at the dock and he goes, hey, you're Captain Steve. You know, how are you catching your fish? And I go like, well, you were watching me. I mean, you should know. And he goes, oh, yeah. Well, tell me about the crankbait you were using. And I said, look, I know. <laughs> I know my satellite said it was a chartreuse crankbait right <laughs> yeah. i know a lot of guys who are fishing this tournament i know a lot of local tournament anglers and they would never ask me that question all right i can't if, and if they won't ask me that question if you want to read my fishing reports i tell everybody what i'm doing in my fishing report if you know if chris called me said what, what color are you using i would tell him if one of the local guys asked me i, I would tell them but when when a pro comes and I'm not sharing that information with the pro that is fishing a tournament against, you know, against these guys, uh, I'm not going to share that information. But a lot of the guys will do that. They will follow and they'll go to a tournament and they'll see who the big sticks are. They'll try to follow them around. They, they've got they use the, the Internet more than anybody I've ever seen. And they don't yeah. use it like like you're using with with uh, Google Earth or they, they want to know the history. They want to know like, well. Rob Greich, he does pretty well in these tournaments. Where, where's Rob? He's fishing a tournament this weekend. 
I'm going to follow Rob Greik, and I've automatically got 20 different spots because mm-hmm. Rob Rob mm-hmm. likes to run and gun, so they get all the the, the spots. Or I want to, you know, I want to fish around where uh, uh, Lenny or Denny Baird is fishing, or or some of these other guys. They know they look at the performance of these guys, mm-hmm. and they look for them, and that's how they're finding these these out of the way spots. Other than that, like I said, north end of the river, a lot of guys won't even go up there. Is that yeah. really? <laughs> Is that really a practical way of actually creating consistent tournament success, though? Because we, we've all heard the stories of, of certain <clears throat> anglers doing things like that, but it's like, will that? can you actually build a career off of that, or would that just be a one-off? It's hard for me to believe that you're going to be able to make a 10, 20, 30-year career as a pro angler going from lake to lake to lake, just creeping on different guides and local sticks. Like, I mean, is that the thing to do? I mean, you're certainly not it, learning. You're certainly not learning. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, you want a little short-term wealth? Yeah, they might help you, out, but I in like the long run, yeah, yeah, you, 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 yeah, you're not, you're not, you're not learning. You're not learning anything, and that's, I think that that's the problem where the sport is going. It's gotten so much of a money maker thing that the the whole ethics, the whole period of the sport has just gone there into the toilet bowl. I mean, I'm like Captain Steve. You just got. I mean, I go here, man. I, there's days I zero at Lake Anna. There's guy. There's times I make zero on the Potomac, but I learn something. But if I go ahead and just follow, you know, X Y Z guy and A B C guy, and you know, I haven't learned anything. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, I could tell you exactly where to go. Don't mean you know how to catch them. And th- that's the problem, man. Everybody wants to just spot burn and go here and go here, but you got to put the dude in. You can't catch them from uh, sitting on the couch. You got to put time in and come at different times and find out what's going on. Like like Captain Steve said, I mean, he's been out here. He knows how the grass migrates and moves away and, and how where the hard cover is. There is no substitution for time on the water. Period. Mm-hmm. Period. Yeah, I I agree with Chris totally. I mean, it's it's a short term investment for these guys. I think that goes back to what we were talking about about an hour ago about these young guys coming up. It it seems okay with them. It's not against the rules. And so that's what they'll do. They'll just go around and, and try to get spots. We prove it every time we take a client out. It's mm-hmm. not about, you know, the fishing skills. It's like, where are the fish? If I put you in a spot that has fish in it and give you a bait that the fish will bite, You'll catch them. You don't have mm-hmm. to have many skills. See, they'll mm-hmm. hook themselves sometimes. <laughs> you know, you get a guy who's fishing, fishing a good bit, and and he starts seeing all these spots, and and they probably I've had them figure out stuff about my spots that I didn't know because they don't mm-hmm. know what I know. So they have a more of an open mind, which is why when I go into a spot, I try to approach it. I'll get on the trolling motor, watch my electronics all the way in, looking for new stuff as I go in, and that's how you find this big rock here or this mm. piece of wood here. Uh, you got to do that. But I think it it does give you short-term results. Um, the guy that I'm thinking about has been, you know, consistently done consistently well. I don't know how this plays on other fisheries, uh, but I'm sure, you know, the Potomac is just probably the most fished tournament fished rear, or body of water in the country. I don't know many you know, maybe Gunnersville or something like that that's got the year round, but for high level tournaments and and high level local tournaments. Local. I mean the guys that the guys that fish here, I mean Chris will tell you they're yeah. they're really good sticks out there. They're fishing these weekend tournaments, Ed Dustin's trail and all the rest of them. They they all those guys who fish that they know what they're doing. And um so I think here it's a little bit different story when they're when they're yeah. following around, but I think they can they can also learn from some of the other ones, particularly the, as as valuable as the grass is, where in the grass is that sweet spot? Or where are these hard to find spots like that guys like Rob Greich have made a living on for 20 years out here fishing tournaments, knowing, knowing in the spoils which side of the concrete to be on and how to make that one cast that they'll come up over a rock. And now with the electronics, you get close and you go like, ah, oh, yeah, I can figure this out. Um, so I don't like that. I like mm-hmm. the old way. Um, and like I said, I know it used to be a time when I knew every pro that would come to the Potomac River. I knew them all. I, I either fished with them, wrote about them and talked to them, uh, been on a, on a, a writer's trip with them. 
And not one of them ever, Alton Jones, never, you know, Dean Rojas, never, Kelly Jordan, never, Mike Iaconelli, never, as well as we all know each other. They call, how you doing, Steve? How's everything going? How's your wife doing? And that would be about it. Where can I get a DC license? That would be all they would ask me. Or maybe they might ask me what the weather's been like, but none of them would say, where are you fishing? What are you doing? And this, these other new guys, they have no qualms. It's like, yeah, that, that's the way to do it. And and they're doing it. Guys, I mean, I, I don't want to keep you till midnight tonight. Um, no, it, you brought up a lot of stuff because I, I do this year want to try to create some kind of syllabus for like rules of engagement on the water for youth because it's such an interesting it's everyone I talk to, it's like, you just, you know, it when you see it and it's like, at some point we got to write this shit down just to be able to give kids and give them some kind of template. Cause it is, it's, it's crazy. And it's going to get worse as we get more boats, but that's a, that's a topic for another day. Um, guys, as always link in the episode description, everything we talked about, I'll have all their stuff linked. So you can go out with these guys. I think Steve's book for the next six years, but definitely try to go out with him, go out with Chris as well. And he also does saltwater stuff too. So Chris, I want to make sure since that we didn't get a chance really to delve into saltwater stuff, I want to make sure that you can pimp that real quick. Um, are you doing Are you doing guided saltwater and freshwater trips right now? Yeah, so I'm probably going into saltwater somewhere in, in the June time frame. Um, so I start doing a little bottom fishing trips. We do spot croaker and stuff like that. I did get some encouraging news um, in North Carolina. So they're starting to catch a lot larger croaker because they were like six, seven inch throwbacks. Well, from what I've been understanding, they've been catching larger fish now. So, not sure what the deal is with the croaker. I don't know if it's netting. I don't know if it's just something with habitat. But um, definitely, that sounds encouraging. Um, we'll see what happens with stripers this year. Uh, that's always going to be a hot topic between that and Menhaden. And oh you know, boy, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Between that and omega protein, and you know that's a sensitive topic, for, especially with a lot of locals in the northern neck. You know where it's a, it's a, it's a job for them. So um, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting season. So, but yeah, usually around the June time frame, we start getting to the specks and reds around late June, going into July. Uh, probably coming out of like Reeville, Virginia, and uh, even Norview Marina off the mouth of Rappahannock too. So it's a Really, really great fishery down there. Awesome. Awesome. Good deal. And then, guys, again, link in episode description, everything we talked about. Uh, please follow these guys on social media, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.